take a time out. Hi everybody, I'm Brian Kenny, and welcome to ESPN Classics Top 5 Reasons You Can't Blame, a series that takes a fresh look at sports personalities who are remembered largely for their mistakes, controversial moments, or questionable decisions. On this program, we defend the boss from the Bronx. On January 3rd, 1973, a group of investors led by Ohio shipbuilder George Steinbrenner bought an underachieving Yankees franchise from CBS for just $10 million. In the decades that followed, the Yankees reclaimed their once dominant position while Major League Baseball was in the throes of a major economic upheaval. With Steinbrenner in the game, free agency spiraled out of control as he doled out huge salaries to acquire the best players available. This created a rift between the large and small markets, or the haves and the have-nots, and Steinbrenner became the personification of baseball's economic divide. Yankee Stadium is no longer the home of the most powerful team in baseball. The Yankees had been losers. They had not been pennant winners since 1964, and that had been the longest stretch uh, that they had gone without being in the World Series since before they got Babe Ruth. CBS had owned the Yankees all those years, and uh, not only weren't they doing well on the field, but they weren't doing all that well in the box office. When a group of investors, led by George Steinbrenner, purchased the Yankees, it appeared as though the once mighty franchise would continue under a collective and corporate mentality. It's particularly important to New York and to the Yankees that the group that gets behind the Yankees at this point have the wherewithal and the interest and the diversity to get the kind of job done. I can remember saying, I'm just a shipbuilder from Cleveland. I'm not really going to be involved in the team at all. Oh, boy. We had been used to CBS, which was an, kind of an absentee ownership, and he basically said he was going to be the same way. Well, <laughs> we know how long that lasted. On New Year's Eve 1974, after an MLB arbitrator ruled that Oakland A's owner Charlie Finley was in breach of contract and declared Catfish Hunter a free agent, Steinbrenner signed the reigning American League Cy Young pitcher to a five-year deal worth $3.7 million. He has always been one or two steps ahead of all the other owners as far as finding ways to spend his money. I can remember talking to George about free agents. He said, hey, Tommy, I'm not particularly happy about it, but if it's there, I'm going to take advantage of it. And what happened in 76 was the Yankees lost the World Series in four games to the Red, and so he set out to improve the team still further, and that's when he signed Jackson. made the team better, he brought people into the seats, they made money. It, it showed such great foresight on Steinbrenner's part. You got Hunter, you got Reggie Jackson, Rich Gossage. He went out and got the best guy, the piece he needed to win, and then they went out and won with it. Popped up, Munson, this could be it. He's got room, he's waiting. The Yankee bench on the field, Yankees are the champions. By winning a second straight world championship in 1978, Steinbrenner had more than delivered on his promise. I'm just proud of New York and happy that these guys battle back because New York's a city of battlers. The boss's reputation as baseball's all-time star raider has only grown as his payroll has soared beyond $200 million. Meanwhile, his teams have won six World Series and 10 pennants. For all his success, he is widely regarded as a financial bully. You can blame George Steinbrenner for a lot of things, and one is that he has apparently utter disregard for the other teams out there. Is it bad that uh, he has blown the salary structure out of the water? I guess for the Kansas Cities and the Tampa Bays of this world, yes. There's a real sense of helplessness. For a small market team, if you get a good player and you develop a good player, once you develop them, George will take them. I think you probably could blame George because he's a little impatient. For instance, uh, Enrique Wilson drops a fly ball on national television at 1 o'clock on a Saturday, and the next night they've spent $13 million to get Raul Mondesi to play right field. George Steinbrenner is still spending money like he's Gordon Gecko drooling over Anacott Steel. 
Just this week, $21 million for Japan's Hideki Mitsui, $32 million for Cuba's Jose Contreras, the latter signing causing Red Sox President Larry Lucchino to grouse, quote, the evil empire extends its tentacles even into Latin America, end quote. In 2005, the Yankees' $208 million payroll was seven times that of Tampa Bay. With the addition of Randy Johnson, five of the top 12 salaries in the game were on Steinbrenner's payroll. I think his free spending habits will, will not be viewed popularly in, in the baseball history books. It's not healthy because Tampa Bay understands and teams that uh, don't have the payroll, you can't compete year in and year out with those clubs. It is getting a little bit out of hand, I think, with one team's payroll 190 or 200 million, and then you got the bottom feeders down here in the 40s and 30s, and it just doesn't make for an equal playing field. George Steinbrenner is the last of the great robber barons. He's a guy who doesn't like to play on an even playing field. It's one thing to say, hey, it's the rules, I'm just playing by the rules. It's quite another to fight lobby, scratch, and claw to keep rules that you know are unfair in your favor. Contrary to baseball, in which local television revenues aren't equally distributed, giving the large market teams an advantage, the NFL took steps by taking control of all TV rights and sharing them evenly throughout the league. Wellington Mara, the recently deceased owner of the New York football giants, could have said in the 1960s, when television first became the big factor, hey, we're New York, we'll keep all the money. It'll be an uneven playing field. If he had done that, the National Football League would not be what it is today. But that's exactly what George Steinbrenner has done. He basically is no holds barred. I'm going to flex my financial power, and I don't care what you think about it. He doesn't care about the pirates of the world. That's fine, and, but, but you know, maybe the time will come when there's only going to be eight or ten teams surviving and able to play. The competitors in a league are simultaneously competitors and partners. And if you don't have some sort of competitive balance, then you don't have a league that functions well. George Steinbrenner is uh, good for New York, but he's terrible for baseball. He just feels that he's not doing anything wrong. Well, it's true the shipbuilding heir did spend like a drunken sailor, but he wasn't the only owner to do so. In this show, we'll count down the top five reasons you can't blame Steinbrenner for the economic divide in baseball. But first, here are some contributing factors that did not make our top five. We call them the best of the rest. The MLB Players Association. In 2002, the union turned down the owner's proposal for a salary floor. The union would not negotiate uh, a minimum payroll so you know the Kansas City Royals could be compelled to put 50 million a year in player payroll it's really a union issue and I think that was the biggest fear is that if you start at the bottom and you see and you create something there inevitably you're gonna end up with a, a cap at the top and obviously they can't live with that our other best of the rest salary arbitration it's available to any player with at least three years service and less than six seasons the reason why baseball's economics are screwed up is because of arbitration. In a deadlock dispute, an arbitrator chooses between the player's figure and management's. Each new arbitration award created the lowest possible salary for a player of that quality. And it accelerated salaries consistently for 25 years. Reason number five, free agency. When Dave McNally and Andy Messersmith successfully challenged baseball's reserve clause in 1975, players were granted the right to sell their services to the highest bidder. Does free agency have a lot to do with economic imbalance? Of course, because some teams are in a better position to pursue the most important free agents. Free agency did jack up the price. Free agency allowed players to bargain for their talent in a, in a free market. From 1967 to 1975, the average player's salary grew from $19,000 to $44,000. By the 10th year of free agency, 1985, it had ballooned to $371,000. The system that came about was not one that evolved, but one that, that came too suddenly, like a tidal wave. If you look back, they could have been a lot more visionary. 
Charlie Finley suggested make every player a free agent every year. Then you'll have hundreds of players vying for jobs and it'll, it'll be a real, real buyer's market for the teams. It would have held down salaries because there would have been a far greater supply than demand. The greatest thing that ever happened to the Players Association was when they restricted free agency, and this year's a perfect example. A.J. Burnett, he's 49 and 50, and he gets $55 million for five years. It's not because he's a good pitcher. He's the best of the bad lot. In free agency's first three decades, the average Major League salary has multiplied 50 times. The salaries in Major League Baseball are growing much faster than almost any other growth industry in the country. Baseball salaries were going to go up stratospherically, whether George Steinbrenner was ever out of building ships or not. One down, four to go. Here is reason number four. Dumb owners. The Yankees may be spending the most, but a number of other Major League Baseball owners are equally guilty of jacking up the salaries. Jerry Reinsdorf once said, we're at the mercy of our dumbest owner. If one guy decides to step out and say, spend $55 million on Darren Dreifer, everybody else has to pay for the mistake because that sets the market. Steinbrenner isn't the one raising the bar. When he signed Bernie Williams, it wasn't the highest contract in baseball. When he signed Derek Jeter, it wasn't the highest contract in baseball. Trailblazing salaries were all established by uh, owners other than George Steinbrenner. In 1990, Milwaukee and Minnesota had the two highest paid players in the game, and Kansas City had the fattest payroll. In December of 1991, the Mets signed free agent Bobby Bonilla to a five-year contract. His $6.1 million salary for 1992 was $2.3 million more than the top salary of the previous season. Any other team signs a megastar for a huge new salary and breaks a new barrier, it raises the cost for all the teams. And the little small market teams are, are in, in death row. In 1996, White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf doled out to Albert Bell the first $10 million annual contract. Why would a man so concerned with the Milwaukee's and Montreal's of the world blow a hole in the salary ceiling? We really don't want to talk about that. That's not important. It's not about money. In 1998, Rupert Murdoch purchased the Dodgers and then signed pitcher Kevin Brown to a seven-year contract worth $105 million. Arliss, did you hear the deal Kevin Brown got? No, no, not a word. I've won five Cy Youngs. How many has he won? None. In December of 2000, Texas owner Tom Hicks gave Alex Rodriguez the largest contract in sports history. We entered into a 10-year contract uh, for $252 million. That has to do with the stupidity of a brand new owner who didn't know there was a number between 126 and 252. That really said that the top level player, instead of being worth 15 million, is, is now worth 10 million more than that. George has been very, very careful over the years not to give the highest contract in baseball. Now, he might take it from the Texas Rangers after they're stupid enough to give it to Alex Rodriguez, but that's not his fault. He wasn't the one that set the bar. Reason number three, cheap owners. Well, there are not too many George Steinbrenners around. It's not just about business with him. It's about winning. But if more owners took that attitude, then you have a little bit more balance in baseball. He has the money and he spends it. And a lot of guys have the money and they don't spend it. David Glass is one of the richest men in the world. He owns the Kansas City Royals. He chooses not to spend his money on the Royals. That's his choice. Uh, Carl Pollard in Minnesota is the richest man in the state. If he wants his team to be a championship club like it was in the 80s, spend the money. In 2005, Pittsburgh, Kansas City, and Tampa Bay, all with comparatively small TV markets, each received more than $47 million from baseball's central fund and revenue sharing. Yet the payrolls of all three teams fell to major league lows of 38, 36, and 29 million respectively. The revenue sharing transfers that they receive are supposed to be used to improve on-field performance of the team. He dropped the ball! He dropped the ball. Clearly, uh, David Glass has not done that. David Glass, the CEO of Walmart, is running the team 
the same way he runs Walmart, and he's pocketing as much money as he can. George rails against revenue sharing in many ways, but he rails against it because uh, his concept is that revenue sharing uh, she should not be used to put in someone's pocket. If I'm a fan of the Devil Rays, I'm blaming the Devil Rays more than I am the Yankees because they're spending less on payroll than what they're getting in revenue sharing. I know when Lou was brought here, he was, he was promised an increase in payroll every year, and, and it hasn't happened. George Steinbrenner was writing these checks to the owners of the Kansas City Royals and the Pittsburgh Pirates, and they were taking those checks and they were stuffing them in their pockets. People get so caught on payroll numbers. When people try to legislate, what number that should be, that's going a little bit too far because they don't understand your business. I guess the saying is don't own a team unless you can pay the piper or deal with the consequences. You can't get any easier than that. You can't just give McClatchy in Pittsburgh all this revenue sharing money and not expect him to put it back in the, into the product. He claims he's putting it back into the minor league product. Well, that's fine. We want to see it pay off on the major league level. Ball throws to third. The ball gets away. Of the Pirates, Royals, and Devil Rays, only Kansas City has had a single winning season since 1994. You've got to spend money to make money. Kansas City, which is a fabulous baseball town, they're not willing to go out and spend more money to put a better product on the field so that the fans will come. And that's critical to Major League Baseball. If they don't put the money back into the team, they can't blame George Steinbrenner because they didn't want to make the investment to make their team better. Three reasons down, two to go. Here is reason number two. Captain Outrageous. Three years after Ted Turner purchased the Braves in 1976, he changed the call letters of Atlanta's local over-the-air station to WTBS and made it the country's first cable-fed superstation. Baseball's problems aren't because there's six signals on a few cable homes in Boston, because they're paying stumble bums $2 million a year. Ted Turner was the genius. He knew that it wasn't good enough to own a team. You had to own the television distribution vehicle. I believe that the deals that we have today in television, in large part, were due to Ted. In 1988, Steinbrenner sold the broadcast rights for Yankees games to the Madison Square Garden Network for $493 million over 12 years. Steinbrenner is the first one, I think it's fair to say, to exploit explicitly the local television market. The explosion in local and cable television revenues took edges that the New Yorks used to have over the Baltimores and Kansas cities and exploded them into large gaps. In 2001, Steinbrenner followed the lead of Turner with TBS by creating the Yes Network, which carries Yankees games to the largest regional cable audience in the United States. George Steinbrenner, when he bought the Yankees, he bought the New York market. You can't make the case that the New York television market is in any way equal to, say, the Kansas City television market. If you can charge a dollar per cable subscriber, and I have 12 million people to get it from, and you have 100,000 people to get it from, I will have more money. So if the Yankees are generating over $200 million a year, and the Kansas City Royals are generating uh, maybe 10, 15 million dollars total local rights fees, that creates a divide. I can spend more on payroll, I have a better revenue stream, and then I beat you. The Yankees are champions of baseball! Blame George Steinbrenner, it's not his fault he's in New York. Capitalism. To the detriment of baseball, our national pastime has served as sport's last bastion of free enterprise. We live in a free market economy, and unless there's a regulator, George Schleimer is and should be free to do whatever he wants with the New York Yankees. I don't blame George Steinbrenner for the economic problems. George Steinbrenner uses the resources available to him in an effort to win. That's what he should do. Back is Brian Williams, a pitch. You can't blame uh, George, George Steinbrenner for being a great businessman and taking advantage of what's already in place. The New York Yankees. World champions, team of the decade. Football would be the same way if it wasn't a salary cap involved. It's baseball's responsibility to legislate within reason so that teams in the middle and at the bottom of the economic scale have at least some chance to compete. For the overall health of the game, you need a little socialism. 
Although the Yankees share 34% of their local television revenue, the remainder of the take is still huge when compared to that of the small markets. They've got to take the local revenue for television, they've got to spread it more fairly. If the people of this city put their money behind this team, I owe it to them to put it back into the team. And some guys don't understand that in baseball. A grand slam for Alex Rodriguez! You can't blame a guy for wanting to win. You can't say anything bad about a guy who wants to win. He has every right to want to win as anyone else, and he takes care of his team. Appreciate the opportunity Mr. Steinbrenner gave me. He's going to go out, he's going to spend money, he's going to put the best product on the field. They didn't get beaten. They went on and they won the ultimate goal. Right now, he is performing as a true American capitalist, and that's the society's uh, creed that we live under. Well, there you have it, the top five reasons you can't blame George Steinbrenner for the economic divide in baseball. Is George really the Darth Vader who oversees an evil empire, or just someone who will reinvest his winnings back onto the field? Whatever your view, the pennants and World Series titles will likely be remembered long after the dry debate of economic inequity between the already super rich. I'm Brian Kenny. Thanks for watching. Well, they always say, what would you like to be on your tombstone? What you'd like people to say? I'd just like them to say, he never stopped trying. That would be good enough for me.